Uh, we are continuing our Make the Change series, and this series, you know, it's exactly what it says it is. We're talking about how to make changes going forward in our lives, and no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, uh, I believe God is calling us out to what might be next, what he would have in store for us. If you missed the first week of our series, you can go back to uh, our YouTube channel, I mean, you can watch any of our archived videos, including week one of our series from last week. Of course, if you are somebody who maybe has, uh, you've got our app downloaded, you can download our app. Uh, you can watch on our app as well as on our website, newwalk.church. Uh, let's go right to God's word as we kick off our time together today, the second week of our series, Ephesians 3.20 is where we're going to be at, and we'll put it up here uh, on the big Bible in the sky, and here's what it says in Ephesians 3.20. God, by his mighty power at work within us, is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. So this text tells you and I, as believers, those of us who are believers... That God has something for believers that is really remarkable. He can take kind of this ordinary life that we have and through what God wants to share with us, reveal to us about our life and our future, can expand beyond even what we could ever imagine, where he wants to take us, how he wants to deliver for us on our behalf. This is a powerful resource. I am not here to suggest that I think every Christian is taking advantage of this very powerful resource. Many are not, but for those of us who call ourselves believers in Christ, we have access to this power of God to take us to newer heights, newer places, and all of creation and all the things that God made in creation. There's only one species on the planet that he designed that he gave the ability to encounter God's power to take us into dreams and vision for something new. And again, as a believer, we get this unique experience of experiencing that power of God. We're talking about allowing God to expand our mind about where we're headed in life, uh, where we might be going in life. And as God gets a hold of the believer and reveals things to the believer, he begins to personally make changes. He maybe then it makes changes for his family and relationships. It expands beyond the individual believer as well. But it starts with us. Of course, you know, there are people on this planet who have uh, ungodly dreams about life. Uh, ungodly vision for how they want life to be. Uh, we know that on this planet, there are people who want their own personal selfish ambition dreams to become a reality. Uh, we know there is a wickedness at times too to people's selfishness and their own broken desires about what they want for life. And as a matter of fact, the, the Bible tells us that there was a time in history where God looked down at humanity and said, the evil dreams and the evil thoughts that humanity has is it's unhealthy, and there was this sort of washing through uh, the flood, and we remember Noah in the scriptures. Uh, this was a time where evil thoughts and dreams were prevailing, but God says to the believer, I want to reveal to you something very unique, something very powerful for your life. Everybody needs a vision. Everybody needs a thought or a dream about what might could be. William Carey, who was a modern day missionary, he had a vision from God to go deliver the gospel to Southeast Asia in Burma. And he set forth on that mission. And you know, people scoffed at him, they laughed at him. You know, they said, Good grief, uh, if, if God wants the message of Jesus Christ to be made known in Burma, let God just do it himself. Why are you packing up and, and headed to Burma? And he said, No, this is what God has called me to do. This is my next. This is the vision that God has. For me, And so he began to set forth on that mission to go deliver the gospel. And he said this very famous quote that I wanted to share with you. As a matter of fact, it's in your notes. It's a fill-in in your notes. If you're taking notes, the notes that we gave you when you came in, you can follow along. And here's his quote. He said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. You can expect that if God reveals a next for you, if God delivers a thought or a vision about where he wants to take you in life, that you can expect that if God gave you that vision, he is going to deliver in a mighty way on your behalf. Hear me, listen, 
If you are here today and you are not dreaming for something greater, if you're not expanding the vision of where God wants to take you in your life, you are flatlining and you are ultimately sinking and, and dying off. What I mean is, think about it like this. In the church world, in America today, we see many churches that are closing their doors. Well, before the church ever felt the need to close their doors, something began to happen in the life of that church. The church began to plateau. How did the church begin to plateau? They stopped dreaming for their community. They stopped dreaming a vision for what might could be for humanity. They got very inward focus. They lost sight of vision and dreams. And so then the church plateaus and then ultimately begins to die off and close its doors. If it's true for a church, you can be sure it's true for us individually in our lives. If you are not dreaming about where God is taking you next, if you're not connecting with him as a believer about what's next, you're flatlining, you're, you're on a progression into what would be ultimately the death of vision for your future. I'm convinced that really the difference between kind of ordinary believers and extraordinary believers is how God takes ordinary people who are seeking God for a vision, for a dream, for what might could be, and God then expands that work inside of the believer, and they step out and experience extraordinary things as just somebody who may have been kind of seen as ordinary. This thought about having a vision or a dream is the difference maker for humanity, for believers. And I think it is real easy to lose sight of dreaming and vision and imagination, right? When you're young, we, we are dreamers, man, and we can imagine things and, and, and you, you can watch. And I, I remember, you know, as, as a young boy, you know, it didn't take much for me to dream. I mean, roll a ball out on the ground, you know, and, and as boys, we'd pick up the ball and start dreaming about being in some kind of game and throwing it around and, and you know, have these visions about something going on, grandeur, right? I mean, it doesn't take much as a kid. I, I can remember when my daughter's we were growing up, sometimes I could peek in their room and they would just be playing in their, in their room with you know, just a few things, but dreaming something big in a moment just uh, of imagination and creativity, right? Our kids can do that, but then something happens in life and we stop dreaming. And, and I think I know what happens in life and you, you probably do as well. It, it's called life. Life happens. Circumstances Hurtful things that take place in your life that start to beat you down kind of regularly. Maybe social settings or relational settings that turned upside down. And all of a sudden it feels like things have been zapped out of you and you've lost your ability to imagine, to be creative, to dream about a kind of a vision of what might could be. We're at the time in our series, the second week of our series, where I want to talk to you and challenge you about what might be next for you. God is personal. And he works on a personal level. And what he wants to reveal to you in our time together about what might be next is different for me. Are you seeking him for vision? I put in your notes, uh, I would say in this room right now, most people fall within the kind of one of five categories when it comes to vision for, for their life and future. And some of you in a time of self-evaluation, I'm going to go through these. Uh, you may find yourself very easily able to say, like, this is kind of where I am right now in sort of vision for, for my life. And so I put these in your notes. If you want to follow along, five types of vision. I shared these. I do a little podcast. I used to. It was a men's podcast, 365 days I did. And we called it the Better Man Podcast. And on that podcast, I think one time I shared these for men. But I'm going to share these with you. And I've seen over... 18 years since we started this church and, and, uh, and, 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 and even beyond that in ministry, I've seen this become a reality. So again, we're walking through these. The first group of people in this room right now is those with no vision. Like really, you start talking to people with no vision and uh, their, they, their simple goal is to make it through the day. And you ask them, hey, uh, what are you, uh, what's your goal for today? I'll tell you my goal for the day. I need to go home and rest. And that's all they got. That's it. That's the expansiveness of their life. One time Jesus was walking uh, down the street, pulled up alongside. He walked up alongside this, this guy on the side of the street. And he asked this powerful question. He said, what do you want me to do for you today? 
what do you want me to do for you? I come to believe that if Jesus pulled up alongside Christians in 2024 and said, what do you want me to do for you? Many Christians could not answer that. They don't have in their mind an expansion of where they're going. They're not seeking God for these visions and the dreams of what, again, might, could be from a God who's able to do far more than we could ever dream of or imagine. I wrote this in, in my notes. Going through life without a vision is like going shopping for groceries without a shopping list. And, and I've done it, and you may have as well. I know this, my wife you know, she's certainly good at making a grocery list and sometimes she has sent me to the store, you know, with the intention of taking a list and maybe I only need to get five or six things, but it'll be very specific and 20 ounces of this and get this brand of this and two cans of this and, and this is the list. And I have been known to, though there is a list produced at home, I have been known to leave the list. I leave it. And so I just wing it and I go to the grocery store and I get the card and I start pulling things into the cart. And I can't remember if it was two cans or three cans, so I get an extra can or two just to make sure we're covered. And, 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 I, and by the time I go through the grocery store, my cart is full of, instead of five things, 35 things. And the, many of them just kind of going over budget, didn't need to do that, but I did it. And, and, and in that moment, it's sort of like a snapshot to what life is without vision. You just start throwing things in your cart, hoping it'll work out. And you start throwing things, like maybe uh, this is enough. And, and we start putting things in our cart that maybe are unhealthy and not what God would want for us. It's a kind of a snapshot of life. In fact, I put in my notes three things that happen when you live a life of no vision. And it's not in yours if you want to write these down on the side somewhere if you're taking notes, but people who don't have a dream or a vision about what might could be, uh, I put in, your, in my notes here, just wrote this down, they're frustrated. And you can tell these people, they're very frustrated all the time in life. And they just can't seem to understand things about life. In fact, I'll tell you a secret about how to identify people who pretty much have no real vision in life. Here's where they are. They go from crisis to crisis, all the time in crisis. There's no bigger thing carrying them moving forward, and so they get stuck in the rut of crisis after crisis. Boredom is another thing I wrote down. Uh, these people that have no vision, well, just, like, why should I even get up this morning? Why? Why? You know, what's the purpose? And then the third thing about people with no vision is they they live a lot of life of regret. And regret, again, that's the portrait of the shopping cart, right? Uh, bad relationships and bad situations and circumstances because I didn't have a vision or a thought about where I'm going. I just, I started inviting things into my life that really maybe God didn't want all along. And so we experience some of those life regrets. Here's the second group of vision people maybe that are amongst us here today. That's low vision. Uh, low vision people, uh, they just don't have a really big challenge in life. They, they, it's just kind of very, very simplistic and there's no big faith steps taking place. Again, no kind of risk it for the sake of God type moments. They did a study of people, and I think I shared this on the podcast, but they did a study of people that they, uh, that they did this little experience where maybe you've seen it at the uh, carnivals where they have the, the bottles with the necks on them and you take the little ring and you try to, the ring toss, and you try to hook it on that thing there and they put people kind of in a position to choose anywhere they wanted to stand on the journey. And then after they chose where to stand and drop the ring or throw the ring, they then asked them why they chose that. And what they found is that given free reign of where to stand way back or up close, that many people chose to come right up to the front and just kind of make it easy and drop the ring. And they asked them, they said, well, why did you do that? They said, it was just easiest. I mean, if the goal is to hook it, you know, and to just go right up to the front. And what they found is oftentimes the people who were willing to just kind of walk right up to the front were people that in their life, they weren't living a life of great challenge. They just wanted to go through whatever was most basic, again, to make it kind of through every single day. This is low vision kind of living. Here's the next group, wrong vision living. 
Uh, these are people who will say uh, that they have some kind of dream. It's really not from God. Uh, but they'll say big, bold, brash things like, I want to be a big time executive. But they really don't ask the big time executives what it takes to be a big time executive. They don't really know the sacrifices, the labor that it took for that person to become successful. In fact, what you might find is, you know, in the big time executive, there may not have been a lot of God given vision on their own journey. And what you oftentimes find is that people who may have achieved some sort of financial or career success in life abandon a lot of other things along the way to get there. In other words, maybe instead of interviewing a big time executive on how he got there uh, or she, uh, maybe interview their spouse and see what they have to say about the journey. In fact, you might be interviewing their ex-spouse and their kids may not know mom or dad who achieved this high level of success because along the way, they kind of abandon everything else. And I've said this over the years and I didn't come up with this quote, but many people climb the ladder of success in life. They get kind of above the clouds and then they find out that the ladder that they had been climbing was leaning against the wrong wall all along. And you don't want to exhaust decades of your life climbing a ladder only to find out it was on the wrong wall. Too many people are giving first class allegiance to second class causes, non-God given causes in their life. Here's the fourth group of vision, people who have vague vision. It's just really unclear and, and they don't have a desire to find clarity on how to accomplish it. I I run into something like this as a pastor. I, I run into other people who are kind of rising up, you know, in their faith, and they'll say to me, I want to be a pastor one day. Great, that's big, that's bold, that's, that's really beautiful. Um, let's talk about what that process might look like for somebody who wants to become a pastor. Well, I don't want to talk about that in the specifics and all the details and the processes and the studies and the testing and all of that that, that comes through, through this kind of the trials of making sure I'm prepared and ready to be a pastor. I just want to be a pastor. And so there's not much understanding of the detail in between and, and, and the steps and the processes to see the vision become a reality. I throw something bold out there, but no real deep follow through. It's just kind of very out there and vague. Uh, you need to know, one of the beauties of studying Jesus' life is Jesus is the most goal-directed and most goal-follow-throughing, whatever the word is, person to ever walk the planet. So if you want to know about somebody who knew about vision, knew what the vision needed to be, what needed to be done to carry out the vision, and somebody who actually carried it out step by step, follow, again, we're drawn back to following Jesus' life. Here's the last group, and those are who I'm talking about today, those who have experienced God vision for their future. They hear me talk about you know, this, this God who has something unimaginable to reveal to us, and they're starting to unpack it in their own life. And as they unpack it, they start to take really the steps that are needed to begin the journey. And I want to talk to you about that here in our time together, that it's one thing to come into our audience here to hear something, to get excited that maybe there's a step that you know you want to take in your life, but then what comes next is you actually have to begin it. And I put this in your notes, and it seems obvious, but it's important to put this down. There is a critical vision step that must take place, and it's called starting it, beginning the journey. I put it down as the principle of initiation of the vision. I'm going to commence. I'm not just going to hear something, you know, a tickling of the ear kind of thing that makes me feel good. No, I'm going to respond to the challenge of like following through on what might be next. Again, it's the difference from kind of ordinary to experiencing extraordinary in your life, this follow-through process. Proverbs 16 and verse 3, God's promise to you today, if you decide to follow through, is this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and here's this promise, reserved for the believers. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and you will what? Succeed. What a promise. But you've got to start. You've got to 
take the step. And for some of you, as God is revealing to you what that step is, it, again, because it's personal, it, it looks different for you than it does for me. But it's this moment where you're going to start trusting God for what might be ahead in the future. It reminds me of the trapeze artist in the circus, if you've ever been to the circus. And there's the trapeze artist on one side, and he's swinging. And then there's the one on the other side. And you know they work up the timing, right? Right? And at just the right time, they kind of everything, and one lets go of the one and tumbles through the air and grabs onto the other one's hand, and the thing is kind of completed that way. And it's a beautiful portrait of timing, but it's also a beautiful portrait of being willing to start and to trust and to believe and to put your faith in. And God's calling us out today, this morning, to say, hey, what is it that you need to start Begin that journey today, just a quick step, just a quick moment, just a, a moment where we start to say, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that step. And, and can I tell you that our church, if you're new, you, you don't know this, but our church is, is filled with people. We have four different services, two on Saturday night, two on Sunday. Did you know we have Saturday night church too? And it's identical to Sunday? As a matter of fact, actually on Saturday between services, we have free pizza. That's another story for another day. But uh, if you talk to people who come Saturday or Sunday, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that people who are uh, been around and been following through regularly on God-given dreams, they're all amongst us here at our church, and they can point to these moments in time, almost like the trapeze artist where they made a decision a couple of years ago, five years ago, three years ago, and they said, God, we're, we're doing this. And if you talk to them, they'll say things like, like, I could tell you about a time in my life where, man, I was facing a big problem, and I just, I, I overcame that problem with God's help, but I can remember the moment where I decided to take that step in previous years ago. You'll hear them say, I, I needed to accomplish a goal. And, and I accomplished that goal with, with the help and the grace of God. But I remember the time where I just took that first step to accomplish that goal, the decision that I made for a change in my life. I can go back. And in the moment, it seems kind of insignificant where we think, you know, it didn't seem like maybe that big of a deal. But then you look back on your life and you say, my goodness, what difference that moment made. And there are going to be decisions that people make here this weekend that are going to affect them for years to come. The, the, the change that you experience in the coming years are always going to be because of a decision you made yesterday or days and years prior. It starts again in a moment of decision where you just make that step to advance into something new. I can remember when I first started out in college and, and, and a few months ago I was talking about like I wear this this college graduation ring. Uh, I don't wear my high school ring uh, because that seemed rather easy to graduate from high school, but graduating from college was like a major deal for me. And so I don't have time to go into how big of a deal too far that it was. But I can tell you this, that in the early first, say, two and a half years of my college career, I just didn't study, man. I didn't. And I would, uh, you know, at any point, anybody would come to me on any given night and say, hey man, you, you wanna go hang out? And I would go hang out. You wanna go play ball? I'd go play ball until the early morning hours. I mean, just constantly out doing different things. And semester after semester, I was on the cusp of being kicked out of school. Academic probation, go, I actually got sent home one summer, you know, and, and I was like always teetering in this place. And, and I know how it happened because I, I wasn't studying. And I remember this one time, and I, 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 I had some guys come to me and said, hey, man, you want to go hang out? You want to go, go play ball? And I just remember this one night, just this moment. It was just a moment where I said, I'm not doing it anymore. Like, I'm tired of being in this place where I'm always worried about not passing, getting kicked out of school. And I made the decision that night to just go study. And, and I can remember and at, back at USF back then, and I don't know that it's this way now, but you could walk anywhere on campus and go into any building. It would be open at 2 a.m., and you could walk in the classroom and just shut the door and just be you. 
And I needed that. I had to get rid of the distractions and I would just go into a room and I would just study it all hours of the night. But I remember the first night that I did that and it led to me continually doing that. And I started telling the guys continually no. And I would go and study. I remember going to cubicles in, in, the, in the library there on campus and, and I would walk out and the sun would be rising as I was getting ready for the next exam. And, and it was that habit that I began to form and it all started in a moment. Just a moment, just a, a simple moment. I can remember walking across the stage, getting my diploma, and thinking, man, how did this happen? Oh, I know how this happened, because about a year and a half prior, I made a decision to get serious. And that's just a little example of something that happened in my life in, in a little moment that played out in such a huge way. And my question for you today in our time together is this, what is it that you need to start today to begin that journey Today, I believe that maybe some of you knew it before you came in, what needed to start and happen. Others of you, God is revealing some changes that you know need to be made right now, and you're getting that in our time together. It reminds me of a very famous moment in the scriptures, and perhaps you uh, or you know about this. It's recorded in history. Uh, you probably heard about Daniel in the lion's den, and maybe you never read your Bible, but you, you've heard about Daniel and the lion's den, and uh, this is the moment where you know Daniel is thrown into this pit with these lions, and and, and God delivers him on his behalf, delivers him from this situation where he's surely going to die. And so some of you may know about that, that moment as it is recorded. Of course, I'm always reminded when I read Daniel in the lion's den that all those years ago in the Old Testament that cats were a problem, and they still are today in 2024. They're just... They're just a problem, but I can't digress too far into that. But I, I think of Daniel, and I know, uh, you know a little bit about his story, and I don't really even want to focus necessarily on his deliverance from the lions. I want to talk about kind of the journey, uh, how he got there, and how he won the things that he put in place to win this battle. For those of you that don't know, you know, this guy, Daniel, was rising up and leadership, and he was on a rather strong trajectory of, of leadership. Uh, in, in, in his time, he had become sort of an administrative leader. Uh, the king, King Darius, had about 120 satraps, which were like governors over territories, and they were in charge of kind of their little areas. But then above the 120, the king had appointed three to become sort of, uh, uh, you know, leaders of the leaders. And Daniel had been rising up over time to become one of these leaders. And some of the other leaders got frustrated with Daniel's favor. In fact, they kind of viewed him as like, hey, the teacher's pet. And they kind of commiserated on how they could take him down from kind of this trajectory that he had been on. It says this in Daniel 6 and verse 4. At this, the administrators and satraps, decide, they tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. So they're looking for dirt on Daniel, and they can't seem to find it. It goes on in the scriptures. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy, neither corrupt nor negligent. Let me stop right there. You want to be a great leader? Be somebody of great integrity. Daniel was rising up in leadership because he was a man of no corruption and of strong character. You want to lead your family well? Be a man of integrity. Be a woman of integrity. Live a life of no corruption and find yourself being elevated. God puts his hand on people who live like this. And, and God has got his hand here in this moment on Daniel. But the men are jealous, you know, and they're upset. And they're trying to find a way to tear him down. And it says this, finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. They come up with a plan to trick really kind of the king, King Darius, to signing a decree that says for 30 days, nobody can worship anybody but the king. And they did this because they knew that every day, multiple times a day, Daniel would go into his room, open up the doors to his room, his windows, and he would pray three times a day to the one true living God. And they thought if they could get Darius to sign this decree, all right, this is not Pastor Darius at our church, this is King Darius, and if he could sign the decree, uh, this would force 
Daniel to choose. Is he going to keep worshiping God or is he going to now for this 30 days worship the king? And so Darius, King Darius signs the, the, the agreement the, and signs it into law and, and then the 30 days uh, starts and Daniel, this man of great integrity, has to choose in this moment. What will he do? In Daniel 6 and verse 10, here's what he did. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, here's what he did. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God and then I love what the next line says. Just as he had always done when? Before. What did Daniel do in the moment of crisis? He, he continued to do whatever it was that he had started long ago. And I don't know when Daniel made that moment of decision to say, you know what, I'm going to worship and pray to my God three times a day. Maybe it had been days before, or maybe it had been weeks before, but very likely you could probably imagine it had been years before. At some point, he made what seemed to be, maybe at the time, I don't know, an insignificant decision to say, I am going to worship my God no matter what. And I am going to follow through no matter what and commit my life to the things of the Lord and he will cause me to succeed. And this became a part of the journey of his life. All going back, again, I don't know when it happened, but there was a moment he decided to kind of live differently, operate differently in his life. And as we know, the rest of the story says that God indeed had his hand on him through uh, the pit with, with the lions. And the point I wanted to make to you today about what we're deciding to do is it's not just the moment that we decide to start. And we see that with Daniel. But it's the continual follow through of everything God has put on your heart. All right? So it's more than just today hearing and thinking and being inspired to make a change. And it's more than just walking out of here and saying, I'm committing to this change. It becomes also the pattern of the follow through that we begin to establish day in and day out to continue to do the things like Daniel did always as he had done before. And that brings me to this point in your notes that it's not just about the start. You need to see the revelation of the pattern and how important it is. The revelation of the pattern. Is critical. I'm talking about beginning today to put into motion the consistency of the things that need to begin to happen. We struggle with this. Again, it's gimmicky time. Everybody's looking for the quick fix. And what I'm revealing to you is a portrait of Daniel consistently day in and day out following through on something three times a day. You, you know, as a child, you're supposed to be taught by a healthy mother and father, spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy, relationally healthy. You're taught inside the home great patterns for life. It's something that parents reveal to their kids. That if you do this and you follow through with this and you live this kind of way and you live consistently in integrity and, and you follow through, this is how God's honoring these patterns of healthy living in your life. As a matter of fact, a healthy mother and father spiritually inside the home, they teach you patterns to honor God, right? In a healthy spiritual home, you would have been raised to, by your parents to develop a pattern of praying multiple times a day, and you would have been taught to read your Bible and study it a couple of times a day maybe. Now, you would have been taught by healthy mom and dad that we go to church and we set forth a pattern consistently and we go to, maybe it was Sunday school or like we have at our church, small groups, and you follow through consistently on a pattern that you learned in your childhood growing up. Now, I'm not stupid. I realize that amongst us right now, some of you are going, that didn't happen for me. <laughs> And I understand that, but you're not left on an island. That's why we're doing this series. You don't have to sit there and go, well, I guess I could never develop patterns. No, you can begin today. And again, it could be one small thing that you start today, but you start following through on consistently. So when the moments come and the trials come, you can be like Daniel and just you, you just did what you always did before. And you're following healthy patterns 
for your life. Some of you need to leave here today and one of the things that needs to happen is you, you need to decide to start praying consistently to your God and worshiping him. And, and, and maybe some of you need to commit to reading your Bible consistently and daily, maybe multiple times a day, uh, consistently attending church and bringing your family to church and instilling patterns into them as the kids go in the kids' ministry and the students go in the students on, on Wednesday nights and, and developing healthy patterns in your own home as well and being a part of our small groups that meet throughout the week. I'm talking about initiating and then consistently following through on the patterns. And I'm saying this because it isn't gimmicky on the way in, you know, it, little bags of trash cans on the way down the hall. It talks about no gimmicks, you know, no, no shortcuts. Like this is, we're talking about change that is very real, but needs to happen through consistent work. And we are in a time, again, at the end of the year, there's all kinds of as seen on TV gifts uh, to satisfy quick gift moments. And then at the beginning of the year, the gimmicks of a, of a $29.99 deal that will answer all your problems or four payments of this and you'll get fully in shape. Last week, I brought up the gimmick of something we had many years ago, the shake weight. Remember the shake weight? And again, like last week, I'm not gonna do the gyrations of the shake weight. But, uh, you know, I shared, like, how silly is this that we thought we could shake this weight and somehow get ripped with abs? You know, like, this is crazy. But people bought it. As a matter of fact, last week after service, there was a line right out here, people trying to buy it from me because they wanted the quick fix for their abs. And I just, I can't sell this. I can't sell this thing to you. Uh, but, you know, even uh, uh, we can be lazy. I can think back, you know, decades ago. You know, now we can, we can turn off stuff in our home right on our phone through apps and, and, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and we can just push buttons. And, and we've been on this quest for decades to have things be as lazy as possible and not have to get up and turn stuff off. And I can remember two decades ago, long before apps and, and, and the Google Home and all that was happening, like we figured out a way that you could stay in bed and turn something on and off. It was called the clapper. Do you remember the clapper? In fact, I brought that here today. I got the clapper and... Uh, as some of you remember this, and, and you could turn a multitude of things off in your home by clapping twice, and you clap twice again, whatever was plugged into this, it would, it would turn back on. As a matter of fact, because this is so handy, I don't know if you're aware of this, but a lot of what we have here in our sanctuary is powered on and off by the clapper. And because it's just so easy for us to turn things off, it has to be a little bit loud. In fact, I want you to be able to, to see it and experience it. It kind of takes us to do it all together. But what I'll do is I'll count to three and we'll clap twice and you'll see the stuff that shuts off because everything's connected to the, to the clapper. So let's do that together. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. See that? It just, just kind of goes right off. And, and that's so handy. And then, and then we got, we got to finish the service. Let's get them back on. Let's count three and then we'll, we'll clap twice again. You can't do it by yourself. It won't work. It has to be all of us together. So here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. So that's pretty handy. Uh, the clapper has always been really handy. And you know what? Again, it's a gimmicky thing, it's a quick fix thing, but that is not going to work in what I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. You can't clap it on and off. You start a pattern, you initiate it, and you follow through day in and day out, and some days it ain't real sexy. But you're doing it over and over, following through on those patterns. Some of you need to develop a pattern of obedience to God. And what am I talking about in this moment? I'm talking about being baptized. The very first thing that God said, okay, you're a believer now? Jesus said, now be baptized. That's the very first thing. And some of you became a believer in Christ, and that's your next step. Others of you have been a believer for a long time, and you haven't even been obedient with the first step to be baptized. And the first step, uh, Jesus said, one of the reasons, one of the reasons is it's a public profession of your faith to let others know that, hey, I have crossed over from death to life and found forgiveness through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got a baptism coming up in two weeks, and some of you need to begin the pattern of just being obedient to God and saying, hey, it's time for me to be baptized. Uh, maybe again, maybe at Christmas you said yes to Jesus, maybe weeks before, maybe weeks after, it's time to be baptized. And right here in the front, 
of the stage. We'll have tanks at the end of every service, two on Saturday, two on Sunday. We'll just have baptisms taking place in between service. And if you're somebody that knows you need to be baptized, you're interested in baptism, write baptism on the back of the little connect card that you got when you came in, the, the card, and just write baptism, circle it really big, drop it in the buckets, and if you give us good contact information, we will send you what you need to know about the upcoming baptism in the next couple of weeks. Two questions for you, and I put these in your notes. Number one, we're deciding today, like, what does God want you to want for your own life? What is it? What is it he's revealing about some steps that you need to begin to take? Another way to phrase it would be, what is the story that God wants you to tell years from now because of a decision you made in January of 2024? What is it? Because that's really what's at stake. Again, what is to be begins in a time like now. For some of you, you know, and when you started the year 2022, in the year 2023 and now the year 2024, there's been something that's been in common uh, all of those years at the beginning of those years. Your finances are a wreck. And they just have been. And you know what? There's a story that you could tell. And let me tell you what the story might be. The story might be three years from now, you're giving a story about how you used to be way up in debt. Like, it was a problem. And, and you used to live paycheck to paycheck, and you had no savings account. There was no budgeting of any kind. But there was a decision that you made in January of 2024. Maybe it was to attend our Financial Peace University group, which we have starting this coming week, and to start getting your finances in order. And you started that process. It was just a moment of decision like we're having here today. But three years from now, you're able to tell how your life changed because of a decision you made today just about your finances. For others of you, your marriage is in tatters and you made maybe just a little decision today to go to counseling. And you just be, you say, hey, we're going to begin that process of going through marriage counseling. And we're going to have a story to tell in three years because somebody stepped up in the marriage and said, you know what, we need to get help now. And we started getting help Today, maybe uh, you have been negligent of your, your spouse and your children and you've been so focused on your career and you've been coming home and it's been five or six o'clock at night or seven or eight and you walk in the door and right now kind of what you do is you go hide out, you go do your own thing, you go avoid everybody else, you kind of have your own selfish mindset and you make a decision today, I'm not going to do that any longer. I'm going to come home from my job, I'm going to pray for God's strength and I'm going to engage in my marriage, I'm going to engage with my children and the story that will be told in a few years is how you, mom or dad, husband, wife, decided you weren't going to veg out when you got home, but you were going to engage in being the husband, wife, mother, father that God has called you to be. It'll be a story that will be told in the coming years because of a decision made today. And the next question I put in your notes is this. So what is one step you can do to start today? Not five or ten, just one pattern begin to develop starting today. If you put five or six, you're going to be a master of none. So you start with just one. One moment, one decision. Let me tell you about a decision, just a decision that I made in, in a moment. And it was transformative, but it happened. Uh, we were a couple of years into the start of this church. And when the church started, we were growing you know, but we didn't have a lot of qualified leaders to help minister to people. It's kind of just me and my wife. And a lot of times because my wife was with the girls, it was just me. And I found myself day in and day out constantly ministering to other families, other marriages. Two years in, it was just total chaos. I was never really around at home. Uh, it was very empty uh, feeling, just like there was no investment in my family. I was investing in everybody else's family but not my own. And I can remember the moment where everything changed and my wife was sharing with me in the kitchen and I had previously, you know, been thinking and hearing other stories about neglected pastor's kids. You know, I, I had heard stories from pastor's kids who grew up in homes where they had a dad who was there, but he was never there. And these dads would be uh, people who would, uh, you know, men who would be investing in everybody else's family, but they grew up without a dad who invested, didn't invest in them. 
and, and, a, and a husband who was never around for their, for their spouse. And I remember in hearing my wife sharing how broken this was making her feel. I can just remember in this moment saying, no more. No more. I'm not going to pastor a church and have my kids not like me because all I did was minister to the church. And, and, and it's workaholism, and, and it can happen at any job and any, in any place to get tired. I just made the decision, it's God first, then my marriage, then my children, then my calling. And I can tell you, and it's 13, 14 years later, my girls are out of the house now, but if you pulled them aside and you'd be welcome to do that or pull my wife aside, uh, they would be able to tell you that, man, dad was there. And dad was invested, and my husband was there, and my husband was invested, and there was a change that took place. And now they look at the church, and they look at pastoring very different than others maybe had experienced. Just because it was just a moment. And I decided to follow through. And something transformative for our family took place. What is it? you need to start. We have a round of groups that are starting this week. Some of you, you've never started a group. You need to start being involved in a group. 70 plus almost 80 groups meeting throughout the week. And there's men's groups and women's groups and topical groups. And I mentioned, you know, Financial Peace University. And I lead a men's group. And there's a pornography group to overcome porn. And there's addictions and thing, marriage groups and helpers. And, and you pick one and say, we're going to sign up and we're going to be a part of this or I'm going to be a part of this. So this is the week they're beginning. They start today, actually, and all week long. If you haven't signed up for a group, you want to know about our groups, it is the other half of our church. Half of our experience meets here on the weekends, and the other half happens throughout the week in smaller settings. Little study groups of 10 to 15 in homes and places all over the community, just connecting more closely with one another, growing spiritually together. If you want to see the groups, go to the information desk on the way out. On the left-hand side of the hallway, they got catalogs. You can browse through and pick out your group. You can go to our website, newwalk.church. You can go to our app, see a listing of all of the groups and register there online as well. As I close, let me leave you with this scripture to finish out our time together. 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 13. This is a moment where King uh, Ahab is in this place and there's this uh, opportunity for him to have a huge victory for the people of Israel. And he's facing this opposing army. And the prophet of God comes up to speak to Ahab about a potential victory. And in verse 13, and maybe this will speak to you as it speaks to me to challenge me for my new year. It says, meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, the king of Israel, and announced, this is what the Lord says. Do you see this vast army? Hey, Ahab, you see the opposition that's in front of you? Here's what the Lord wants you to know. I will give it into your hand today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. But who will do this? The prophet replied back to him. Ahab wanted to know, like, who, who's going to deliver this? This is what the Lord says. The young officers of the provincial commanders are going to deliver it. And then Ahab asked this question that I hope every one of you are looking at in our time together today. And who's going to start the battle? And the prophet responded, here's who's going to start the battle. Ahab, you will. And what I hope it speaks to you today in the year 2024 is this. You got a big battle in front of you. Who's going to start the battle? You will. You will take the step with God's help. You will advance forward with God's help. And you will have a story to tell about how there was an opposition against you, but God worked on your behalf to deliver mightily for you. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, right now, you're revealing uh, steps for uh, believers across this room. We have many people here in this room who would say they are believers in Christ Jesus. And God, I pray that you're just individually revealing through conviction and just what might be next uh, for the future, giving a vision for a next step uh, for each of us. Father, you're revealing that individually, just as you are an individual connecting God. I thank you, God, for, for those uh, revealings that are 
are taking place, patterns that need to develop. But Father, I'm also well aware that in a room this size, there are many people here, that there are unbelievers here. Maybe they came for the epic weekend or for their kids or whatever it was. But right now, uh, the truth is they don't have this dream, this God-given vision for their life. They don't know what future with God looks like because they don't have a relationship with God. They're not a part of the family of God. But you can do just as I did. I can reflect back on the time where I made the decision to follow Jesus Christ, and it was in a church, and I heard the pastor preaching, and I just said, man, I need to make that decision today, and you can do it right where you're seated. You can say, man, I want to have a relationship with God, and God says, if you want to have a a relationship with me, you need to be forgiven of your sin, and Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross for the forgiveness of sin for all of humanity once and for all, that for all who would accept God's final sacrifice, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. They could enter into a covenant of forgiveness only given by the Heavenly Father through Jesus. Would just right where you're seated today, would you just receive forgiveness right now? God, forgive me of my sin. I accept the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, for salvation, forgiveness of humanity. I'm receiving that now. In the name of Jesus, I God, I come to you and say thank you right now for forgiving me. I don't know how this journey goes and dreams and vision. I want to learn all that. But today, God, you're forgiving me and I am beginning anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.